Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 8th Annual Norman Borlaug Lecture. And I'm Don Bites, and I'd like to sincerely welcome each and every one of you to this uh, very special evening tonight. Uh, the uh, Norman Borlaug Lecture, uh, obviously named after Norman Borlaug, was uh, organized uh, by the Nutritional Science Council. Financial support is through the University Committee on Lectures, funded by uh, GSB. And so uh, this particular uh, lecture honors the life and work of Dr. Borlaug, who's um, whose picture is uh, going to be before you. There. Uh, Dr. Borlaug passed away on September the 12th, 2009 at his home in uh, Dallas, Texas. He was known as the father of the Green Revolution, as you've heard many times, and the man who fed the world. And uh, many of you maybe have read the book, uh, The Man Who Fed the World. And I thought it might be appropriate to read a short statement on the inside cover of uh, this particular book. From the day he was born in 1914, Norman Borlaug has been an enigma. How could a child of the Iowa Prairie who attended a one-teacher, one-room school, who flunked the university entrance exam, and whose highest ambition was to be a high school science teacher and athletic coach, ultimately achieve the distinction as one of the 100 most influential persons of the 20th century? and receive the Nobel Peace Prize for averting hunger and famine, and eventually be inhaled as the man who saved hundreds of millions of lives from starvation, more than any other person in history. Uh, Dr. Borlaug is one of the five people in history to have received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, the Congressional Gold Medal, the Pre uh, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, President Bush, uh, presented uh, Dr. Borlaug the Medal of Science, and uh, in a conversation, I am told uh, with uh, President Bush, uh, President Bush asked um, when you're going to retire and uh, live uh, more peacefully, easier, or whatever, and uh, Dr. Borlaug says, there's so much more work to be done. I plan to die with my boots on, and uh, he did. Um, a few uh, personal data on uh, Dr. Borlaug. He was born on a farm in uh, Cresco, Iowa uh, in March, on March 25th, 1914. Um, his wife, Margaret, uh, and he uh, celebrated their 69th wedding anniversary. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and she died in 2007. Uh, Dr. Borlaug in high school was uh, a wrestler. And in fact, uh, he was on the same wrestling team as the famous legendary Harold Nichols of the Iowa State wrestling uh, coaching fame. Uh, he and Margaret had two children, Norma Jean and William, and they have uh, five grandchildren and uh, six great-grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Borlaug uh, followed his friend, who got a uh, baseball scholarship, as I remember him telling me, to the University of Minnesota. And he got to the University of Minnesota, and he needed some financial help, and so he went to the wrestling coach and said, uh, give me a scholarship for wrestling. And he uh, became a member of the wrestling team at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he earned a master's degree in 1940 and a Ph.D. in 1942, all from the uh, University of, of Minnesota. Um, his... Uh, Employment, uh, he started out with uh, working with the U.S. Forest Service as a plant pathologist, ended up working some with DuPont and left that to work with the Rockefeller Foundation and ended up working at CIMIT, a research center in New Mexico, uh, with the uh, project of trying to develop a more uh, productive wheat, which, as we all know, uh, he did. In his uh, later times, he became a distinguished professor at Texas A&M University and was president of the Saskakawa African Association. Because this is, his latest goal was uh, to fight the hunger that uh, is and perhaps will be in Africa. In uh, 2004, we had uh, 
the distinct pleasure of having Dr. Borlaug accept an offer of the uh, Nutritional Science Council to be the summer lecturer. And what that means is that a person gives 10 hours of lecture to a group of faculty and students on a specialized topic. And uh, of course, the uh, specialized topic of Dr. Borlaug was uh, uh, meeting the global food needs of the world, of global food needs. Well, we had record enrollment for that summer lectureship in 2004 and record attendance by non-enrollees, uh, uh, faculty and others. And what a pleasure it was for uh, all of us, students, faculty, staff, to interact with Dr. Borlaug during that week. Um, I always remember uh, three afternoons a week we had it scheduled where he would uh, visit with students in a conference room in Kildee Hall and, and uh, what I called halftime in the afternoon, about three o'clock, I said, Dr. Borlaug, it's time to take a break. And uh, he said, oh no, I'm having fun. Uh, just send more students. And uh, that's the attitude that uh, he had. Um, and uh, we all know that Dr. Borlaug is the uh, person that uh, saw fit to start the World Food Prize. And the first uh, World Food Prize was offered in 1987 to uh, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. So um, what a man. We can all say that. What a man. And any of us that have had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Borlaug, what a pleasure that was indeed. So in honor of Dr. Borlaug and his family, shall we all stand for a moment of silence? Thank you so much. Well, it's uh, my distinct pleasure now to uh, turn the podium over to uh, President uh, Joffrey, who will introduce our speaker for the night. Dr. Joffrey. Thank you very much, Don, and uh, thank you for that uh, tribute to Dr. Borlaug. Uh, uh, you didn't mention that uh, he was 90 years old when he was uh, holding uh, forth in that summer session. And, and I can remember a few years ago when uh, he gave a lecture here to, I think he was 92, to a packed audience with as much enthusiasm as any uh, lecturer uh, any time. Uh, we certainly do miss him. Uh, tonight, we are honored to have as our Norman Borlaug lecturer, uh, this year's recipient of the World Food Prize, Dr. Gibisa Ijeta, who will receive uh, his award Thursday in Des Moines. This is the first time that the current World Food Prize laureate has presented this lecture, and we're very grateful to Dr. Ijeta for coming to our campus in what is an incredibly busy week for him. Uh, we also want to extend uh, our congratulations for this uh, wonderful honor um, that uh, in so many ways reflects the legacy of Dr. Borlaug. Uh, like so many of the world's great uh, scientists and humanitarians, including Dr. Borlaug, who grew up on a small farm in Iowa, Dr. Ijeta came from very humble beginnings. He was born and grew up in a one-room hut in rural west-central Ethiopia an area that was devastated by poverty. Uh, but despite the dire economic conditions, Dr. Ejeta's mother was determined that her son would receive an education so that he'd be able to rise above the poverty and do something meaningful with his life. And of course, she succeeded far beyond her wildest dreams. She made sure that her son went to school walking 20 kilometers every Sunday night to attend school during the week, and then walking back another 20 kilometers every Friday to return home and help his family. His mother's determination and Dr. Ejeta's perseverance paid off. He advanced with honors through grade school and high school, earned a bachelor's degree from Alernaya College in Ethiopia, and a PhD in plant genetics from Purdue University. Dr. Ejeta decided to use his knowledge and plant breeding skills 
to make a difference in his native Ethiopia. And as a result, he's made a difference for an entire continent. His work with the International Crop Research Institute for the semi-arid tropics, based out of Sudan, resulted in the development of a drought-tolerant, weed-resistant, high-nutrition, and high-yielding varieties of sorghum that have become the staple for half a billion people in Africa. The varieties that he developed were the first hybrid varieties of sorghum introduced into Africa. They increased yield up to five-fold, and one in particular was developed with an effective resistance to the striga plant, or witch weed, which has long uh, devastated sorghum yields throughout Africa. Beyond developing these varieties, he's worked to integrate seed distribution with farmer education programs and conservation efforts to promote sustainability and better economic conditions among African farm families and rural areas. Uh, Dr. Ejeta continues his work today as a faculty member with Purdue University, where he holds the prestigious title of Distinguished Professor of Agronomy. And he's staying true to his mother's wishes by partnering with leaders, farmers, and educational institutions in Africa to help other African young people get the knowledge and skills they need to raise themselves out of poverty and help many others do the same. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Igibiza Ijeta, the 2009 World Food Prize Laureate and the 2009 Norman Borlaug Lecture. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey, for inviting me uh, to speak here and for that uh, nice introduction. I thank the Nutritional Council and Dr. Don Byth for extending this invitation through the President's office. And I also thank Dr. Jeffrey and And thank you for having Sanayat and I at the Knoll for dinner tonight. Appreciate it greatly. Uh, I'm particularly thrilled to be speaking to uh, this lecture series that is named after Norman Borlaug, uh, the person whose life and work that have been extensively described and we all admire. It is particularly um, honoring for me uh, to be invited to speak also at this campus of Iowa State University. Uh, as a plan reader, Iowa State University is distinctively known for its excellent plan breeding programs. I'm afraid I will be chastised tomorrow by all of the great schools in the country, at Purdue University, University of Illinois, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Cornell, North Carolina, Davis, and all of these strong universities that have excellent plant breeding program. Uh, but I will stick my neck out and declare that Iowa State University is really the mecca and medina of plant breeding. At, at Purdue University, we call our university the cradle of astronauts. <laughs> I think uh, you need to begin to call Iowa State University also the cradle of plant breeders. I, will, I feel how, how gratified you must be feeling um, and how proud you should be as well that the science that started at this university and the vision that started at this state through the families of Henry Wallace to really have catalyzed the major agro-industry complex that established the 20th century agricultural revolution in this country that started here. It's, it's a huge distinction. And then build upon that 
to have that experience and that expression to have laid the work of Norm Borlaug, to have taken that agricultural revolution to Asia and create the Green Revolution. Um, just for the honor of uh, the individuals that from my limited experience and through the help of uh, some uh, wise individuals that still serve as an institutional memory here uh, that shared this with me. Uh, names like Jenkson, Jenkins, um, Sprague, Bill Russell, Arnett Hollar, Ken Fry, Richard Atkins, C.R. Weber, Jay Pesek, and then uh, my good friend Don Duvick that I have had the, luxury, the privilege of having worked with. To have these kinds of individuals come through this program and produce outstanding individuals in plant breeding over the years, it's indeed a huge honor for me to, to come and speak here. Uh, I have chosen um, the title of Revitalizing Agriculture Research for Global Food Security. And um, I'll share my thoughts with you on that. After nearly two decades of relative complacency about agriculture, world leaders and representatives of development agencies appear to have reawakened to its importance of economic growth and political stability at home and in the developing world. They have also come to a new realization of the need for sustained support of agricultural science and technology generation to transform agriculture in developing countries and say, sustain the advances made in rich nations. This sudden and dramatic shift in world opinion has been prompted by the convergence of several ominous trends. The work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has left no doubt that global climate change will have profound impact on agriculture during the coming decades. The thrust of climate change coupled with the rapid pace of world population growth threaten global food security. The recent energy crisis, food price inflation, and the global economic recession reveal the vulnerability of communities everywhere, and in particular, the lasting hardship imposed on the poor. Together, these trends present agriculture with a truly daunting set of challenges as well as a potentially great opportunity. In this paper, I assert that we may have arrived at the emergence of a new realization. Uh, we now recognize that our world is not as food awash as we once believed. Problems involving global food production and distribution continue to linger as one of humanity's fundamental challenges. I believe that we have the capacity to rise to these emerging challenges and assure sustained global food security. We can do this by revitalizing our agricultural sciences and recommitting to the time-tested, mission-oriented legacy of our land-grant university models and its ideals. The land grant model legislated in the 19th century helped build this great nation and made 20th century American agriculture the envy of the world. It has succeeded internationally, bringing about the Asian Green Revolution, championed by Norm Borlaug, soldiered by MS Swaminathan, and many others. I believe that even in the face of emerging 21st century issues, like climate change and uncertainty of the global energy supply, the land grant model can be counted upon once again to address the challenges of doubling food and feed production. The success, uh, the, su the success of modern agriculture. Over the last century, the U.S. agriculture sector has become one of the most productive in the world. And citizens of this country, as well as the rest of North America and Western Europe, have become accustomed to a safe and relatively inexpensive supply of food. Agriculture research in genetics, crop and animal husbandry, weed pest and disease control, through chemical inputs and integrated pest management approaches, modern farm machinery, development of post-harvest technologies and value-added products, spurred the nearly tenfold increase in commodity yields in the United States over the last hundred years. The first agriculture revolution was brought about by the advent of corn hybrid technology that gave rise to the private seed industry and the associated complex of business services and partnership. One way the success of modern agriculture is reflected is in how much we pay for food. 
In 1933, according to the USDS Economic Research Service, Americans spent more than 25% of their income on food. By 1940, the figure was 20%. By 1975, that declined to 13.8%. By 1985, it was 11.7%. In 2000, it was below 10% for the first time in US recorded history and down to 9.6% even in 2008. International statistics provided by ERS only account for the percentage of disposable income spent on food at home. Still, the numbers show huge disparities between the U.S. and other countries. The U.S. percentage is 6.1 percent. The next low, lowest figure comes from consumers in the United Kingdom at 8.3 percent. German, German consumers spend 10.9 percent of their disposable income in food at home, followed by Japan at 13.4 percent. South Korea at 13, France at 13, among high-income countries. Among middle-income countries, South Africa at 17.5 percent, Mexico at 21.7 percent, China at 28 percent, uh, and Russia at 36.7 percent, are seeing rapid decreases in food expenditure percentages, but are still relatively high. India, 39.4 percent, and Indonesia at nearly 50 percent are among the highest when it comes to the amount of disposable income spent on food. In contrast, the poorest nation of the world spends 70 percent or more of their disposable income on feeding their families. The success of modern agriculture resulted not only in increased crop yields and decreased food price, uh, prices, but also in the growth of the agribusiness sector. Uh, one example is the hybrid seed industry that, uh, that you know the story very well. I couldn't b help but notice the, the business of Henry Wallace is the first year the profit was at $33.62 in 1928 and doubled in, in 1929. The Asian Green Revolution. It was a success of U.S. agriculture that spurred the advent of the Asian Green Revolution, converting nations such as India from basket cases to bread baskets. In my view, the transformative change brought about by modern agricultural sciences in his native Iowa inspired Norm Borlaug to dream about helping the poor in developing countries overcome hunger with the breakthroughs he achieved in wheat genetics. He saw how the advent of hybrid corn and private sector initiatives with the seed industry and other agribusinesses spurred not only productivity increases on farm, but also enhanced the livelihood of both rural and urban Americans. Fresh from the economic hardship of the Great Depression, this must have been an easy lesson for young Norm to take to heart. But with his brilliance, he gave more. In my testimony before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations hearing on global food security last March, I offer the following characterization of this great American's contribution to bringing modern agriculture to the poor. I quote, no, Norm Borlaug, universally acknowledged the father of Green Revolution, is a hero to me and very many others. I personally admire his single-minded devotion to science and agricultural development and his unending empathy and service for the poor. He's been a great example for scientific leadership and a life so well lived. As I reflect on his accomplishments and leadership, however, in my view, the genius of Norm Borlaug was not in its creation of high yield potential in input responsive dwarf wheat varieties, not even in its early grasp of the catalytic effects of technology, but to a great extent in its relentless push to mobilize policy support to encourage the development of the agro-industry complex to sustain the synergistic effects of technology, education, and markets. The end of quote. The Asian Green Revolution transformed agriculture initially in Mexico, India, and Pakistan, expanding, expanding later into Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Philippines, Taiwan, China, and even to parts of South Asia. This successful venture to eradicate hunger and reduce rural poverty in these densely populated regions of the world was made possible, yes, through agricultural sciences, but it would have remained just another brilliant research finding as an end unto, unto itself in the absence of sustained investments of governments and foundations in agricultural education, research, extension, infrastructure development, and the support of local governments for credits and markets for inputs and outputs. 
An intended consequence of this success was that the early achievement of the, great, the Green Revolution were dramatic enough to create a false impression that the world's food and farming problems had mostly been solved. As a consequence, the international donors who had provided strong support for agricultural innovations in, and investment in the 1960s and 70s and 80s began pulling money and support away. America's official development assistance in agriculture in Africa Decline, declines approximately 85% from the mid-1980s to 2006. In fiscal year 2008, the United States spent 20 times as much on food aid in Africa as it spent to help African farmers grow their own food. As always, others followed the trend set by the U.S. and global public investment to agriculture research dwindled. How Green Revolution Missed Africa. Africa was simply not ready for science-based development campaign at the time. While the Asian Green Revolution was being launched in the 1960s, independent Africa was being born. Much of the human and institutional capacity essential for an agricultural revolution in Africa was weak and non-existent. At the end of Second World War and into the mid-1960s, just after the flurry of newly independent African nations, few Africans had earned graduate degrees in agricultural sciences. Very little functional science infrastructure existed across the continent. The vestiges of the few entities left behind by colonial leaders had no substantive research programs aligned with Africa's national development. The colonial agriculture research farms were no no more than test stations for commodities of European interest, such as cotton, coffee, tea, and cocoa. Unfortunately, even when these budding research programs expanded, expanded into field crops and livestock, the lack of human capacity meant that the scope of their research remained very limited. They focused more on adoption of improved techno imported technologies than on developing new stocks from lo local sources. Gradually, with domestic and foreign investment, the long time consuming process of institution building and laying a foundation for science based development began. The last vestiges of mass hunger linger in Africa and South Asia, where millions of people live in abject poverty and are regular victims of hunger and occasional famine following nature's calamities. Hunger and poverty are humanitarian flashpoints. We saw during the 2007-2008 period of extremely high world food prices that human distress in this area can lead to violent political confrontations. The distress of the poor caused by these higher prices has focused greater political attention on food and hunger issues. Only three years ago, the world lamented some 800 million people suffered from chronic hunger. Today, some 25,000 people die each day from malnutrition and more than 1 billion people, nearly one-sixth of the world's population, suffer from chronic hunger. Sadly, for these very poor 1 billion people, a food crisis becomes a chronic and a permanent problem. Not a temporary, not a temporary situation that can exist, exit when the global economic recession shown size, shows signs of recovery or the per barrel prices of oil declines. All too often, it becomes a multi-generation condemnation of the body and soul that it seems only sacred intervention may undo. Clearly, the causes of hunger are many, including natural, social, economic, and political factors. Generally, a global, global hunger is a result of poverty and lack of gainful employment. It can also res result from broken social networks at home and in the community triggered by natural disaster, civil disturbance, war, or displacement due to forced migration of otherwise settled people. Food shortages can also result from curtail curtailed total production and or constrained distribution of existing supply. Global hunger is a moral issue and a fundamental problem too big to ignore. It limits the potential of individuals, communities, and nations for generations. It also undermines all other developmental investments by and on behalf of poor nations. The political and social stability of all nations, poor and rich, can be compromised by national, regional, and global hunger. 
Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton eloquently articulated the problems at the announcement of the 2009 World Food Prize in Washington, D.C., when she stated, and I quote, this morning, one billion people around the world woke up hungry. Tonight, they will go to sleep hungry. The effects of chronic hunger cannot be overstated. Hunger is not only a physical condition, it's a drain on economic development, a threat to global security, a barrier to health and education, and a trap for the millions of people worldwide who work from sunup to sundown every single day but can barely produce enough food to sustain their lives and the lives of their families." End of quote. Farming became a profitable undertaking in the developed world where breakthroughs in the science of agriculture dramatically transformed production practices and increased farming efficiency. It drew great investment from both rural and urban businesses. Crop yield levels reached greater heights Incomes grew and food prices declined. An unfortunate result of this was that society began to take agriculture for granted. In light of the pressing need for public support and other society needs, securing public funding for agriculture and agriculture sciences became difficult. Interestingly, the private sector was investing heavily in agriculture in the rich nations about the same time that public funding was dwindling. Although hunger still prevailed and rural poverty in developing countries was becoming rampant, rampant the, decline, the decline in public funding for agriculture in the developed world carried over to foreign assistance for agriculture. The decrease in foreign assistance created a further decline in public spending by the governments of developing countries instead of increasing to compensate for the loss of foreign aid. Public spending on agriculture as a share of total public spending in most developing countries de declined significantly uh, from 7% in 1980 to about 4% in 2004. Sadly, the surplus production in the developed world was perceived as a solution to the shortages in developing countries. Food aid became biggest instrument of intervention to address the problem of a growing food demand in developing countries. By 2007, Rich countries devoted a mere 4% of their foreign assistance to agriculture. In Africa, which has the most severe food problems, donor aid to the farm sector plunged uh, from 4.1 billion in 1989 to just 1.19 billion in 2006. Africa's per capita production of corn, its most important staple crop, has dropped by 14% since 1980. Equally troubling are sh sharp cutbacks in research into new technologies, farming techniques and seed varieties that could increase yield cop yields, cope with changing climate conditions, battle new pests and diseases, and make uh, food more nutritious. Agricultural science has become a victim of its own success. The decline in public funding for agriculture and agriculture research, both here and abroad, led to less and less scientific interventions to advance production agriculture and more to address the emerging problems of natural resources in the environment. Between 1970 and 1990, global aggregated crop yields rose by an average of 2% each year. Since 1990, however, aggregate crop yields has risen by an annual average of just 1.1%. The USDA projects that growth in global farm yields will continue to fall. U.S. commodity yields are growing at a much lower rate post-1990 compared to the post-Second uh, World War 1950-1989 period. However, um, um, only about half as much reduced support from public farm, public farm productivity enhancing research is a major cause of this slowing in farm level productivity growth. The farm productivity orientation of U.S. public R&D funding has dropped from 68% in 1985 to 57 in 2006 and 2007 in a continuous pattern. Research funds are being redirected to food safety, nutrition, environment, and other worthy goals. We know that rural hunger and poverty decline dramatically when education, investment, and new technologies give farmers better ways to be productive. This happened in Europe and North America in the middle decades of the 20th century, then in Japan, and then on to the irrigated lands of East and South Asia during the Green Revolution in the final decades of the 20th century. And then came the rude awakening. 
The initial shock was general agreement by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that the warming trend felt in the last few years will continue and may endanger hundreds of millions of the poor in developing countries as early as 2020. The potential problems arising from climate change in terms of worsening food and water shortages in regions of the world where the poor dwell are huge. This is particularly true in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, aggravating the growing pressure on land, water and food supplies as disheartening developments. The global economic recession and skyrocketing costs of energy around the world made things worse, worse as higher energy prices directly drove up the cost of agricultural inputs such as inorganic fertilizers, insecticides, and pesticides. Farmers in the developed world were able to work around this nexus because credit was still available, though tight. But the ability of small farmers in developing countries to respond to the incentives of higher food prices through increased production was much more limited. Furthermore, the 2008 food price crisis showed us that the global food sh shortages could bring about disruptions in life that would resonate to the far fringes of the planet. Between 2006 and 2008, the average world price for rice rose by 217% wheat by 136%, maize by 125%, and soybean by 107%. In late April 2008, rice prices hit 24 cents a pound, twice the price that it had been seven months earlier. Several factors contributed to the food price crisis, a perfect storm of poor harvest in various parts of the world, increasing biofuel usage, lower food reserves, growing consumer demand in Asia, rising oil prices, change to the world economy, hoarding and government closing export trade in some countries. Fam families in the United States and Western Europe felt the effects, as did the masses in developing countries, and with dire consequences there. It became evident that without the general balance between food demand and supply, to which we have been accustomed, food scarcity and volatility of food prices will pose a critical global food security. In spite of, and possibly because of its proven success, U.S. public investments in agriculture research have dramatically declined in recent years. U.S. funding of natural agriculture research institutions of developing countries has declined by 75% since 1980. Its support for the Consultative Group on International Agriculture Research, the leading network of international research centers responsible for developing innovations in agriculture production system useful to poor farmers in the developing world, has been cut by 47% and its funding for collaborative research projects between American and developing country scientists dropped 55%. In the spring of 2009, a confluence of ideas emerged. Called for was an end to complacency and revitalization of agriculture research focused on alleviating hunger and energizing science-based development. Among the first voices that emerged on the topic was one that came th through an excellent report developed by the Chicago Council for Global Affairs. It made compelling arguments for renewing attention to agriculture in U.S. development policy, calling for increased support in agricultural education, research, and extension, both here and abroad. It argued for research support at multiple levels, including domestic institutions, national programs in developing countries, and the International Agriculture Research Centers. The second major initiative to appear was the Luger Casey Bill uh, for Food Security Act, submitted to the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Senator Richard Luger, co-author of the bill, summarized the challenges when he said, and I quote, the food security challenge is an opportunity for the United States. We are the indisputable leader in agricultural technology, a more focused effort on our part to join with other nations to increase yields, create econ economic opportunities for the rural poor, and broaden agricultural technology and knowledge could strengthen relationship around the world and open up a new era in U.S. diplomacy." End of quote. The luger Casey bill seeks at to uh, at reorient U.S. foreign assistance to focus on hunger and poverty and to help counter the emerging global food crisis. It seeks a streamlined food security strategy, additional resources for agriculture productivity and rural development, and improvement of the U.S. emergency response to food crisis by creating a separate emergency food assistance department. 
The Luger Casey Bill is a back to basics approach in its focus on science based development and calls for US universities to engage in agricultural education, in research, in extension programs with developing countries. In July 2009, um, at the GS Summit, global leaders pledged more than $20 billion to support a renewed global effort towards food security. In addition to the financial commitments, global leaders established principles to follow. These included use of comprehensive approach, investment in in-country laid plans, local, regional, and global coordination, involvement of multinational institutions, and delivery of accountable commitments. In the fall of 2009, Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative consultation document was just recently issued by the U.S. Agency for International Development to begin a new process for comprehensive approach to food security based on country and economic-led planning in collaboration with partners. Agriculture's renewed status as a vital resource for the sustainable uh, sustainability of human civilization and the stability of peace and prosperity in the world brings great opportunities to the agricultural sciences to build on its legacy of success. Science and technology must evolve uninterrupted if they are to continue to have the capacity to respond to emerging societal challenges. It goes without saying that sustained investment in science is a basic essential for a society. Nevertheless, in my view, it's also critical that these investments are made in purpose-driven science. Societies that do not invest in revitalization of the agricultural sector and in advancing the agricultural sciences that serve humanity are in danger of facing another round of cruel surprises when the next series of food and resource shortages come around. Our food and natural resource problems are also becoming increasingly more and more complex with highly interconnected ramifications. The solutions for these problems will require that we develop a more global perspective with respect to the nature of the issues we address as scientists, as well as to the breadth of consideration they will require. The following challenges reflect uh, the types of emerging challenges, the complexity of their nature, and the diversity of tools required to adequately address them. And just to use uh, the first one as an example, as we all know, and this is the, the message Dr. Borlaug uh, uh, preached for a long time, that the world population is increasing it's about nearly six billion now, expected to increase in the next four decades or so. And uh, uh, the implication of that is that we will have to figure some way of doubling our food production in the next four or five decades, suggesting perhaps that we will have to learn how to produce as much food in the next four or five decades as we did since the beginning of civilization. And not only that, uh, we are a lot more sensitive about how we would go about getting that done than we were, you know, since uh, uh, in, in, in the 20th century agricultural revolution. And so the responsibilities that we have for natural resource con con uh, conservation and sensitivity to the environment and the need to boost productivity means that we have to be dealing with very complex sets of issues. And so the way we would need to approach uh, solving those problems are going to be changing. Uh, maybe interdisciplinary approaches, a more system-wide approaches. And so to be able to develop the kinds of research tools and skills, we would have to invest today before the problems become complex. And the, and the tendency is to take the, uh, the productivity growth that we have for granted and not, and not be investing, and that's a kind of a danger that we may be facing. And so I'll move this through this quickly and maybe leave it for interaction later on. Globalizing U.S. agriculture research institutions. Um, maybe a few comments on why we need to globalize. Um, international technical assistance is often taught in terms of humanitarian assistance, but it's an issue that is more than compassion-based. It's more than just the right thing to do. National, diplomatic, economic, and even security interests are, are implicated. 
nations that have their development, diplomatic and defense interests aligned along ethical grounds would not have their global stature compromised. Such nations hedge against serious dangers arising from failed states, have greater chance of increasing their economic and trade exchange, and heighten their moral standing and opportunities of cultural growth of their populace. There is a great legacy of U.S. universities in helping build and strengthen institutions in developing countries. Institutional and human capacity building remain at the most lasting contribution to the growth and development of nation. Institution building is a necessary foundation in nation building. Universities in the United States have played significant roles in the development of many such foundations. Early investments have strengthened the economic development of very many poor nations while enhancing the vitality of the better endowed countries. The history of U.S. foreign assistance is replete with several such experiences and with varied levels of success. Some argue that old institutional programs are no more in vogue, but they need to be back in vogue because I can't think of a more lasting contribution one can make to help a nation than to build its human capacity and strengthen its fledgling institutions. I'm a product of a technical assistance program and I can attest to it with some confidence and authority. These are the series of institutional building, um, international agriculture, globalization activities that U.S. universities have engaged in with great success. Uh, the capacity building and institutional building efforts, if I would go through some examples, um, a number of U.S. universities have been involved in the development and strengthening of institutions in India. Um, Purdue University for years started the College of the University of Agriculture in Visosa and helped build EMBRAPA along with uh, several other universities in the United States. Uh, I'm a product of a technical assistance program the U.S. Agency of International Development put in place in Ethiopia through Oklahoma State University. Today, the who is who of agriculture in my country had come through that university that was supported by Oklahoma State. And, and I learned uh, uh, recently that Iowa State University has had a long history of involvement in Central and South America uh, for a number of years, starting as early in 1945, when they first established the Tropical Research Station in Guatemala. Uh, one of the models for uh, uh, institution building uh, that, that I suggest that we all consider is that if institution building as the way it used to be was, uh, was too expensive, may not work under the current situation, uh, a model that, that potentially work is with sister university concept, uh, both in developed countries and developed, in, developed in developed country institutions. The international agricultural research systems. Uh, there are about 15 international centers around the world. Several of our U.S. universities have collaborated engagements with them. I know, among others, um, the Iowa State University has a relationship with CIMIT and maybe many others. And uh, there are a number of universities that are not involved in those kinds of engagement. Um, more and more of that uh, need to be, to be encouraged if, if we are going to um, expose our own students and faculty, develop perspective about uh, the rest of the world, and bring in the world to the classroom, and also bring our faculty to the assistance of an institution somewhere else so that uh, we create an, a better world. I'm, um, I'm serving as a member of the Science Council of uh, the International Research Centers. As part of that responsibility, I was rash, uh, charged to develop a think piece for how to mobilize linkages between U.S. universities and, um, and uh, 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 the International Agricultural Research Centers. Um, I make two arguments in, in that piece, and one is we need uh, collaborative linkages for uh, advancing science in the upstream linkages. Um, because uh, science and, and technology is emerging, emerging at a fast pace. 
and findings for science are coming not only from the traditional sources of North American universities and European universities, uh, but they're coming also from non-traditional sources. Uh, nations like China, India, and Brazil have become uh, tr uh, uh, sources of knowledge. Um, and, and new powerhouses then are emerging in advancing uh, this science. And also the private sector. It used to be, even when I was in graduate school, the source of knowledge was the public institutions and industry was uh, a source that took that, converting it to technology and commercializing it. Today, the way we do science have changed. It's all based on, on uh, sophisticated equipment, sophisticated tools, and the private sector has invested more on it where they are beginning to lead in the technology advances. And so collaboration with the private sector is also in our best interest. So we need for all institutions to further strengthen their science, and for their partnership and alliances, uh, so that we have the synergy that is needed from public-public, public-private um, uh, linkages that we can develop. I also make a similar argument um, in the downstream linkages, and, and that is that uh, uh, we've maybe shied away or moved away from our science for development ideal, and, and uh, we may need to, to get back to it. And this is particularly apparent when you deal with developing countries where uh, there is a push to advance the cause of science for agricultural research, but yet the uh, technology dissemination delivery linkages are very weak. And so if we don't link the discovery to product development to technology delivery, then the utility of science to, for changing life, livelihood is not going to take place. And so building relationship both, again, public-public and public-private partnership in that area is getting to be crucially important. Uh, we organized a science forum recently in... Uh, in um, in Netherlands. Um, and and uh, uh, we have participation from both, uh, from all over the world, really. And uh, uh, we, we, we had a, a good dialogue. And, uh, and, and my hope is that new cr linkages would be created, not only with the land grant universities and the international centers. Um, the, these are the traditional linkages, but also the science in the non-land grant universities here need to be brought in to be solving some of the more intractable problems that, uh, that we deal with. And, and I think the opportunities are greater if we also expand those opportunities to them. Uh, the key essentials um, uh, for uh, revitalizing agricultural research for global food security, uh, I think the following key essentials are crucially important. Uh, revitalize the U.S. land grant university model to meet the needs of today. Uh, mobilize our universities and research centers in earnest uh, global efforts. Uh, strengthen the public-private partnership of our education research programs. And embrace and lead dialogue and plans for emer emerging societal challenges. Uh, revitalizing agricultural research for global food security will require commitment at multiple levels. We need our educators and researchers who uphold the ideals of public service, expose the scholars for, to opportunities for social service, push for appropriate funding at key state, federal, and global levels, and uh, look for supplemental funding from foundations in the private sector. Let me, let me conclude my remarks uh, with these statements. Um, a revitalization of the agricultural sciences is badly needed to avert another food crisis and to assure global food security. In a world where demand for food is rising and available food can easily be mobilized around, assuring local food security is, a vital, is, is vital if we are to have global peace and prosperity.
However, reinvigorating the production, processing, and distribution of the world food system will require earnest commitments and major changes in national and international policies. These include renewed support for the science of agriculture, natural resource conservation, and protection of the environment. We need more than a change in the federal framework supporting agriculture research. We need an infusion of federal funding to address the challenges facing us in food security and availability, preventing disruptions to food supplies, and managing agriculture and natural resource systems. The problems of agriculture are becoming increasingly complex, requiring more holistic and integrated approaches to solving them. Tackling these complex problems adequately demands serious consideration in the mobilization of the talent needed, as well as in resource commitment to support earnest efforts. Past investments in agriculture research have produced solutions for problems of yesteryears, and are the, we are the proud, proud of that legacy. We need to now embark, and emerge, uh, uh, embark on the emerging challenges and early on. We have a talented cadre that is eager to be mobilized. We need the necessary resources to be able to tackle these seemingly intractable problems of agriculture, natural resources, and the environment. It, it will require that we also rekindle in the new generation of scientists the sense of purpose espoused in the wisdom of Langrad University model. I'm certain that with some rethinking, the available talent can be mobilized to effectively address these complex problems. New funding opportunities are emerging for catalyzing a revitalized global engagement in the agricultural sciences. If world leaders act on the recent pledges to boost support for global agricultural research and development, it will spark a new era. We will see new science-based solutions to problems of hunger, natural resource conservation, and protection of the environment. I'm hopeful that the commitments being made for international technical assistance will be made by concurrent commitment from national governments for domestic agriculture research, both in the U.S. and other countries. A revitalized agriculture research with holistic approach to sustainable growth in agriculture is the key to averting future food crisis, dealing with natural resource conservation, energy and water shortages, and adapting to climate change. Thank you. Dr. Ijeda will take uh, questions, and uh, we have a mic in the center, if uh, you'd uh, please use that. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk, Dr. Ijeda, and congratulations on your prize. Um, I, you mentioned multiple times during your talk uh, agribusiness, and uh, in the United States, one of the effects of agribusiness was moving a lot of these small family farmers off of uh, the farms. And in Sub-Saharan Afri Sub Africa, uh, that uh, a large percentage of the people, while they're spending 70% of the money and probably the physical effort on um, running these small farms, um, what, what do you see? What's your picture of what you see? Do you see an agribusiness like what we have in the United States coming into sub-Saharan Africa, or do you see uh, a, um, uh, a university extension program that teaches the farmers who are there in place and doing farming uh, to, um, uh, to uh, become much more sustainable? Uh, thank you. Um, I want them both. I want a public extension service that is revitalized. Uh, we have tried the land grant university model to have research, education, and extensions to work in, in developing countries where it's given the chance. It has worked very beautifully. But the problem in many of the developing countries is the model cannot be put in place where it can work very well. And one of the uh, problems that we've had is education is in one ministry, research is in another ministry, and extension is in another ministry, and trying to have them orchestrate and the interconnections in getting people educated, do the research, extend the technology has been very, very difficult. I didn't have the time to go through the various paradigm shifts 
that are taking place in technology extension in Africa, and various approaches have been tried, and in some places worked relatively well, in others they did not work. And so what I would like to see is, is, is a balanced approach um, of getting some public service put in place with the mechanism that would force it to work and work well, so that we are mission oriented, uh, the, 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 the sense of purpose that we need to have improvements in livelihood and develop in farm communities have taken place through the service of public extension program. If we could get that going, that's very good. But also, there is a limit on how much of that could take place. There is a limit on how big an extension service, a public uh, program can, can develop and grow. And so it is in the best interest of the community to also encourage the private sector. I think we need to realize the opportunities that the catalytic effect of the agribusiness complex that is emerging, bringing about opportunities for gainful employment, even for those that have to be forced on the farm. And so this balanced approach, uh, if we could give it an opportunity to work, is, is what I would like to see. Uh, Dr. Ejeta, yes. um, I'd just like to thank you for your wonderful lecture and for being here tonight. It's a great honor. Um, my question is kind of a follow-up of the previous. Um, advancement in the use of agriculture technology um, in order to encourage high yields um, unfortunately has caused a decline in some areas of, a of Africa of arable land. Um, specifically uh, with nutrient mining where erosion and leaching of the soil um, has actually um, decreased yields. Um, what, I guess, programs are in place now or what are they looking to the future, I guess, to have an effect on maybe encouraging um, nutrients like either fertilizers or whatever um, going back to the soil or are there other programs that they're looking to put in place? Can I politely disagree with your premise? Yeah. I don't know of any situation in Africa where the nutrient mining has resulted or the degradation of the environment has resulted as a result of excessive use of technology. I think the problems in Africa has been for lack of technology, therefore uh, the, the land is mined, the land is continually degraded because we're continually mining the land with no uh, feeding back to the soil of nutrients at all. And so anything that we could do to encourage crop rotation and, and natural practices, uh, uh, cultural practices that would encourage the enrichment of the nutrients in the soil, uh, including use of inorganic fertilizers. I think, you know, one of the things that you would be totally surprised to find out that in the 1950s, uh, maybe early 60s, total fertilizer use average in Africa was around nine kilograms per hectare. Today, it's about 15% or less at the most. So we've got a long way to go in Africa uh, before the concerns that you expressed could become to reality. But the point, important point in your message is to be cognizant of that possibility of the problem that arises and learn from the mistakes of the developed world and be cognizant of that uh, possibility and be sensitive to the concerns of the re natural resources and the concerns of the environment. But we've got, we've got a long, long way to go. And so uh, I, again, as I said, politely disagree with you in terms of the need for encouraging the use of a modern technology in African agriculture. Dr. Ijeta, let me first of all congratulate you on a brilliant lecture. My name is Chelston Brathwaite. I'm from IECA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, based in Costa Rica. And um, you have made a very significant call for action, a call to return agriculture to its rightful place in development, a call for more engagement of the entire society in uh, focusing on the challenges that we have as we move forward in this 21st century. I would like to congratulate you on your award. One of the things that impressed me about your award is the fact that you are working on a crop 
and a group of crops that are not traditional. Traditional in the sense of our concept of five basic crops that humankind has concentrated on, on in the last 50 years for the basic nutritional needs. And I think it's very important that we begin to see our world and our future in the context not of the traditional five of wheat, maize, potatoes, soybean, and rice, but in the context of those crops that are vital for the food needs of the developing world, such as sorghum, yams, sweet potatoes, edos, bananas, etc. And the need for technological research and technological information on these crops is critical for the future because these are the crops that the majority of the people in the developing world need and that is where the great population growth will take place in the future. That's the first point. The second point which I would like to raise which uh, is more of a question rather than a comment has to do with technological research. And I wonder whether in fact the critical need is not more for education rather than for research. Because in a real sense, one of the failures of our agricultural paradigm today is that a significant amount of the technology has not been transferred. And it has not been transferred to those who need it most, which are the small developing farmers in the developing world. And part of the reason it has not been transferred is a lack of education. And I wonder sometimes whether we're not putting too much emphasis on the technology and not sufficient emphasis on education in order for the technology to be transferred. My last point has to do, in my view, with a focus not exclusively on agriculture, but a focus on agriculture and health. Mainly because I see a problem looming. More and more people in this world are dying from non-communicable diseases. And one of the real tragedies of our time has to do with the increase in these non-communicable diseases which is associated with bad food choices. Not so much malnutrition, but bad food choices in terms of what people eat. And I wonder if there is not a need as we go forward to look at nutrition and the relationship between nutrition, health, and agriculture as a nexus for the new phase of development. Those are my comments. Thank you. These are great comments. I don't think there is a need to react to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, is there any movement towards bringing agriculture, population, and natural resources together to work together and to see the whole picture. Uh, you know, other than echoing the sentiment of the need to do that, um, there are there are very few places. I think your own sustainable ag program here at Iowa State University is a good example, trying to to do that. But but again. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make in my presentation here is these problems are getting more and more complex. And the nexus that you identified is a very good example. And, and so the need to begin to have themes, thematic programs in place where we begin to look at a holistic approach to the, the, to the situation. Um, a number of nexuses we could develop. And I think the consensus is that there are a series of these grand challenges that are emerging. Um, but, and then there are enthusiasm among our faculty developing for these challenges. We're beginning to visualize and develop a cadre of faculty that are interested not only in the narrow fields of research that we all do, but we, being, we begin to, to be interested in addressing societal challenges. But that needs to be met with concomitant funding that would encourage at the policy level to encourage us to take that up because Trying to find solutions for those is not going to happen overnight. It's going to require for us to begin to develop the tools that would allow us to address that. Even that is going to take time. We need to invest in those today so that we would be in a position when that problem really is earnest. We have a team of people who are who have become uh, able to to address those. I think. Uh, 
this is a long way around the, the point that you're making, but I agree we need to begin to do that. And I think there is a lot of discussion along those lines. Uh, my own department, we spent nearly two years trying to identify grand challenge problems that we, based on the skills and talents that we have, are going to be able to address. Some of those grand challenges I identified are out of the, uh, the grand challenges in our department that we identified. I recently saw a grand challenge list from American Society of Agronomy. Those are fairly similar with the grand challenges that we identified. So if we could do the same at Iowa State, I don't think it would be much different. But again, that interest, that earnest identification of what we need to do is the first step. And the second is we need to get the resources so, so we are able to begin to do, uh, s provide some of the evidences that we're on the right path. And then the third would be to actually solving the problems. <clears throat> Congratulations to you, uh, Dr. Egert. My name is Richard. Miro, uh, when you talk about uh, investing more in our culture or revitalizing our culture, technology development for food security, what's your view about the increasing cash needs even among you know, poorer communities who at the same time you know, having uh, food shortages? You know, they have, when you talk about technology, you're also talking about their ability to invest in using that technology. I don't know what your view is about the increasing cash needs nowadays, even beyond you know, free, uh, agriculture, and actually the actual need of investing in technology. And maybe the other point would be the place of markets for smallholder agriculture or developing country agriculture. So the balance between food security markets that could help with the cash needs, and then uh, uh, certainly the balance between cash and food. Thank you. No, what you're raising is a very important point. Uh, what, what you're raising is a very important point. Um, I, I have no reservation whatsoever in indicating uh, science-based development is a key for uh, changing life, livelihood in Africa in developing countries. But at the same time, um, policy interventions are needed. And one of those policy interventions is subsidy. I don't know of an, uh, an economy that developed without significant subsidy from governments in agriculture. And in Africa, we've been advised for too long to shy, to shy away from subsidies. And so as we demonstrate technologies to our poor farmers, they're willing to take it. But one, their, contrib their investment in agriculture technology is not compensated at the market level. And so there is a need to help them with that. But at the same time, we need to also make the burden of investing in the input market for them lighter, meaning that some subsidies are required. Uh, but, but I don't think the substitute then is to leave them without science, because I I, I see that as a solution for, for a lot of the problems in Africa. We have uh, two more items of business before we adjourn. Uh, first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ejeta back to the uh, podium. And we have an award that um, we would like to present to you. It's um, a um, glass sculpture, laser engraved with the image of the corn husker from uh, our um, long ago artist in residence, Christian Peterson. And it's entitled The Norman Borlaug Lecture 2009, Iowa State University, Ames, Iowa, uh, Gabisa Ejeta. And now uh, Don Bites has some award winners to announce.
Thank you, President Joffrey, and thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. This is another very exciting part of the evening, and that is uh, recognizing uh, the folks that uh, displayed their research. They're some of our bright undergraduates and graduate students who are working on uh, world food issues. We had uh, 18 participants with 12 posters, and we thank all you participants for uh, sharing your uh, research with uh, the audience. Also, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, Colleges of Agriculture and Life Science, Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Human Sciences for financial support of our uh, poster contest. And uh, thanks to the group of judges who uh, worked diligently to rank all of the posters. And I am told that this is the best contest ever. The judges had a very difficult time deciding who is third, second, and first in the undergraduate and graduate student categories. So uh, they did, though, come up with uh, three winners. And uh, we would like those folks to come forward and receive their award from President Joffrey. And congratulations from both President Joffrey and uh, Dr. Ejata. And uh, after you uh, pick up your award, just stay off to the side as a whole group and uh, we will uh, recognize you appropriately. So for the undergraduates, the uh, third place uh, poster is, was presented by uh, Rachel Farhat, um, Amanda Chung, and Alexis, Alexis Beyer. Second place poster was by Sam Bird and Nate Looker. Would you come forward, please? <laughs> the uh, first place winner in the undergraduate category is um, Ren Weston. And uh, her poster was Introduction of Menstrual Management Resources to Primary School Girls. The uh, third place in graduate students, uh, Lisa Wasco. Lisa? And while she's coming forward, the title of her presentation was Ugandan School Garden Program Influences Agricultural Knowledge Transfer and Home Gardening Practices. Second place, Hanjin Jang. Uh, numbers, second position. Title of his uh, poster, Dosage Effect of High Amylose Modifier Gene on Resistant Starch Content of Maize Amylose Extender Starch. And the first place winner is Eric Nonicky. <laughs> Title of Eric's poster was Nutritional Status of Pregnant Women in Rural Kamula District, Uganda. So, those are our six winners for tonight, and let's give them all as a group a last round of applause. Thank you, President Joffrey and Dr. Ajita. And thank you all for uh, participating in the poster contest, all you uh, 18 participants. And uh, what a joy it is to see so many of you here tonight. This was a, a wonderful evening. Thank you for much, so much for your participation in the eighth annual Borlaug Lecture. We will do this again next year. Come back. <laughs>